Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Dr. Richard Smith. He's got a website, The Shape of Risk, and a PhD in systems science. We're going to talk about making decisions under uncertainty, Robin Hood, and its impact on new investors in the market right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquirers Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. Let's talk a little bit about Robin Hood. Great. The, the, the SEC has proposed this um, ban on payment for order flow. Yeah. And <laughs> my understanding is that's basically how Robin Hood makes its money. So what's the likelihood of that happening? And uh, is that the case that that's how Robin Hood makes its money? And what do they do if this ban comes into effect? It is how Robin Hood makes its money today. And uh, meanwhile, Robin Hood has built a an admirable user base at this point and their users will mature. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I started my uh, investing life back in 1998, 99 or so, I got a, uh, an account at TD Waterhouse at the time. I haven't changed my account, man. You know, it's, uh, it's been 25 years almost. And the inertia to change your account for something that's essentially a commodity service at this point, um, just, uh, you know, it's not really there. So I don't think Robinhood's going away, even if payment for order flow <laughs> does get banned. Um, I do think there are some real issues with payment for order flow. And uh, I even have a alternative proposal for uh, Secretary Gensler. If actually, he's not a secretary. What do you call the head of the SEC? Chairman Gensler. <laughs> um, about how I think he could address his concerns, which I think are really legitimate. Um, and, and also, it really illustrates um, how Robin Hood has gotten its toehold. And, you know, I, I have very mixed feelings about Robin Hood because, on the one hand, I deeply admire uh, that they've brought so much interest to the markets and made the markets so accessible. Um, as I'm sure you know, as a professional investor, accessibility does not uh, equal success, you know? And to me, accessibility, um, you know, more often leads to failure because, uh, you know, kind of the lowest common denominator of retail finance, I'm afraid, is an addictive relationship <laughs> with the capital markets. And I would love to talk about that because I've actually just written a piece on that that um, is actually going to come out today. I think it's a really serious topic to talk about these patterns of addiction uh, that are really driving a lot of the business models in retail finance right now. But just to go back to what kind of Robin Hood has uniquely done um, in terms of a revenue model is, you know, they're able to take a much lower size account because uh, their customers transact in much wider spread much less liquid um, assets, right? So huge options trading, you know, for really tiny accounts, right? I mean, to me, the guy who really has um, pulled the veil back on this more than anyone is Paul Rowdy over at alphacution.com. Um, he really looks at market structure in a very deep way and how market makers and retail investors, retail broker dealers like Robinhood, um, you know, have really, uh, you know, let's agree, brought a new generation of <laughs> participants into the markets. I can't really call them investors at this point. You know, I'm sure there are some investors, but uh, Robinhood is making its money off of um, transaction frenzies in, uh, illiquid assets. And that's how they've been able to generate so much revenue, you know, uh, with small account sizes. Now, 
I don't think that's going to end well. You know, 25 years of my experience in the markets um, tells me that that's not the uh, recipe for success. I'm sure as a value investor, <laughs> you would agree. And, um, you know, I'm personally very interested in how do we help retail investors to actually, you know, lengthen their time horizon that they're focused on, whereas everything right now is compressing the time horizon down to, you know, um, shorter and shorter time frames, right? So just to, you know, back up and make sure we're clear on the payment for order flow issue. Yes, Robinhood makes its money off of payment for order flow. That's when um, they work with wholesale market makers like Citadel Securities to, um, I mean, there's Citadel and there's Citadel Securities. I'm not quite sure which one's which, <laughs> but uh, Citadel's market making arm, right? Um, they will get a better uh, execution price than if Robinhood went straight to the exchange. And, um, and then Robinhood gets a portion of that price improvement and the user gets a portion of that price improvement, right? And, uh, and then Robinhood has just, you know, really amped that up in a way that no other retail broker has done. You know, they make, made huge amounts of money on options in one queue. I think that was the GameStop frenzy. And then in two queue, they made huge amounts of money in Dogecoin you know, tens of millions of dollars, right? And I think, you know, payment for order flow like phenomena are coming into cryptocurrency now too. So, um, so that's kind of the basics of payment for order flow and Robinhood's model. And I can't swear to this, Tobias, but I think that Robinhood uniquely negotiated um, deals with some of the major wholesale market makers where they earn a percent of the spread, okay, as opposed to just getting a fixed fee for, um, uh, for payment for order flow, right? So that incentivizes them to go into wider spread trades, right? And, you know, uh, what's wrong with Robin that? What's wrong with that? It incentivizes Robinhood to put their novice uh, customers into illiquid widespread trades like options, for example. And uh, um, I do think that that's a uh, very risky way to proceed for novice investors. And I think it creates you know, a bit of a conflict of interest between Robinhood and its users. How does Robin Hood's approach to investing differ from some of the more established uh, brokers that that are out there? And why is their behavior, why does that necessitate a regulatory response? Again, uh, Robin Hood has brought many small accounts uh, and facilitated engagements in the markets, right? And um, versus somebody like Schwab, for example, I think the average account at Schwab is maybe $250,000 and the average account at Robinhood is $2,500, you know, ballpark figures. I don't think I'm off by an order of magnitude, right? Um, so, you know, traditionally the SEC has, uh, you know, looked to protect smaller retail investors. I think that's what you have at Robinhood, right? And um, there's also an element of what are the wholesale market makers doing with the data that they get from the uh, Robinhood users and other retail uh, traders, right? So I believe that Robinhood really has taken the uh, Silicon Valley user as product business model that, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, et cetera, and has imported that into retail finance. And that is done in collaboration with the market makers. So instead of, you know, Google and Facebook might have advertisers that pay, uh, you know, to get the attention of the users of the platform, right? And Google and Facebook are incentivized to 
um, nudge behavior <laughs> in the direction of their paid customers, right? They're paying customers, which are the advertisers. And I think that Robinhood is incentivized to nudge behavior in the direction of its paying customers, which right now are the wholesale market makers. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, we don't really get to see what the wholesale market makers do with that data, how they use it to, you know, make intelligent decisions in the markets. They're really in the business of risk management. Um, but, you know, I think they're getting value out of that data and that's why they're paying for it. So I do think that sets up a conflict of interest with Robinhood's users, potentially. I would love to just see more transparency around all this. You know, if it's so great for retail investors, such a great deal, you know, let's see all the data, you know, let's see what are the assets that are really driving transaction fees at Robinhood. And is that ending up being profitable for its customers? What are the uh, wholesale market makers able to do with this data? Um, and how is it profiting them and their other, uh, you know, their sister businesses? So I think all those questions are really unclear um, and it would be great to see more transparency. You know, the SEC actually made a rule change a couple of years ago that required broker dealers to disclose the relationship of payment for order flow with wholesale market makers. That didn't exist, that wasn't happening before two years ago. And that's why payment for order flow is a household word today, household phrase, I guess, um, because the SEC required that disclosure. And before that, Robinhood didn't tell anybody that it was making money on payment for order flow, you know, and they actually even kind of pretended that they weren't. So more of those kinds of actions by the SEC, I think even on the wholesale market maker side, more transparency, more disclosure. I think some things would come to light that in the end, you know, could help us all make better markets. It's such an incredible generational opportunity right now to engage a new um, generation of investors in the capital markets, hopefully for decades right? And not just up to a flame out like we had in, you know, March of 2000, right? And uh, which I, you know, am personally concerned uh, is an elevated risk right now. So I would love to see all these young investors, you know, learn to love capitalism, learn to love capital markets, not have this just be kind of a war against Wall Street. Um, but I think we all got to work together to do that, you know, and I think that everybody wants a better future and uh, especially for the markets, everybody wants the markets to succeed. And, you know, we only have ourselves to look at to solve this problem, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can I, do something about it. When I look at Robin Hood, yep. two, I think that there are two issues. One is that uh, we don't necessarily know what's happening to that order flow and it might be front run or used in some other way. Mm -hmm. um, but if ultimately that allows you to trade more cheaply and more, uh, in, m more in a more illiquid stocks more easily, then mm -hmm. it's probably a good thing. The other problem, which I think is possibly the bigger problem with Robin Hood is the gamification, if you like, of mm -hmm. the the experience from the perspective of a user when there's a lot of um, they've, they've imported those Silicon Valley, social media, dopamine hacking elements that make you want to do things on the site. You get yeah. confetti going off and they simplify the trade, the tra you know, an option trade, even for experienced investors is a reasonably complex thing. You've got to think about, are you getting sufficiently compensated on the volatility side, there are lots of other, you know, is the underlying where yeah. you want it to be? Will it end up being where you want it to be? And they, they've condensed all of that down into, do you think the stock's going to go up or down? Or do you think the security is going to go up and down? Which is um, potentially too simple. So do you, 
and and that's sort of to to, to your yeah. point about the addictive the addiction uh, side yeah. that 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 dopamine hacking is certainly oh. an addiction. So I've just been finished up a book called Dopamine Nation. It's a new book out right now by Stanford uh, psychiatrist and you know director of the Medical Addiction Center or something like that, Dr. Anna Limke. Uh, wonderful book. Not a lot of behavioral finance in it, but she does talk about um, some research around gambling, for example. And so, you know, the, the, four, the four things that really trigger uh, dopamine release in the brain, right, in the neurotransmitters, one is um, getting a reward, right? So, uh, Two is anticipating a reward. <laughs> we're doing that all the time, right? Uh, every time we look at the screen, you know, we're thinking, oh, am I going to get a reward, right? Even if it's just a temporary paper reward, right? The market's up today, my portfolio's up today, whatever. Um, and then uh, three, another one is that if it's a rich, complex environment with lots of learning opportunities, that's another thing that elevates dopamine levels, okay? So, I mean, you can spend your life learning about markets, right? <laughs> that is a rich, complex environment that you can you know, learn a lot, right? And then the fourth one that really was uh, particularly relevant is that um, if, the, if the environment is highly randomized, okay? If it's really like 50-50, that's the maximum situation where dopamine is released, you know, in your attempts to one, anticipate reward and try to solve for reward, right? So, and that actually ends up in, in gamblers, it produces what's called loss chasing, okay? So, you know, you actually enjoy losing for a while because of the thrill of you know, the outsized thrill you're going to get when you finally get that reward, right? Meanwhile, we know, you know, markets don't tolerate loss chasing indefinitely, right? <laughs> As uh, John Maynard Keynes said, uh, markets can remain irrational longer than we can remain solvent. You know, risk of ruin is, uh, is a big issue and it, it, it does eventually catch up with loss chasers. So all these things are going on in the markets and they're creating a very, you know, addictive relationship with our screens and with the markets. The presence of dopamine, you know, is an indication of an addictive experience, whether it be drugs um, or, you know, retail financial markets. So all of that is going on. Um, you know, going back to my uh, wish for transparency, if Robin Hood would disclose, you know, what they're gamifying and, you know, what they're making money on, um, I'm pretty certain that we'd find a correlation between those things. I thought you were going to quote the, uh, the Keynes <laughs> quote where he says, um, investing is intolerably boring to those who don't possess the gambling gene, but you know, if you I do, then you have that to... in my article that'll come out uh, later today. <laughs> if you do have, possess that propensity, you have to pay the toll or something like yes, that. Yes, you I've, do. I've it. You do. And, and, you know, it's fine if you say, hey, here's my play money. This is entertainment. I'm going to pay the toll, right? But that's not really what most people do. It's not investing. It's, it's not investing. No, it's not. You know, and to say that access to markets equals investing which is what the Robin Hood PR machine says over and over again, is really disingenuous, you know? It's really disingenuous and it's really setting, I think, a generation of investors up for potential catastrophic failure. To what extent do they have an obligation to those investors to ensure that they have some success in the markets? And to what extent are they just facilitating a transaction? Well, um, I wish I knew, you know, on the one hand, I do uh, believe that um, the founders really did 
set out with an aspiration to democratize investing. Um, I think that like anyone who's running a business, you know, you do end up having to uh, um, not be entirely idealistic <laughs> at some point to generate a profit, right? Um, and then I think that they got swept up in, you know, a bit of a um, unique situation with COVID and everybody all of a sudden taking an interest in retail finance. And, you know, uh, Mr. Tenev even, you know, admitted recently, like, hey, you know, uh, we didn't have all our ducks in a row to, you know, really take on this level of responsibility. So, you know, I do sometimes hear him talk about uh, really being in this for the long haul and wanting to encourage long-term participation in the markets. Um, but when I see, you know, the quarterly uh, statements come out and I see all the revenue from meme stocks and Dogecoin and GameStop and AMC, and I see the research of Paul Rowdy over at Alphacution, you know, showing how this data is being used to put together market structure and, you know, market uh, forecasting by really sophisticated players. Um, you know, when Robinhood stops making money off of uh, YOLO type trading and FOMO type psychology, that's when, you know, I'll really start to breathe a sigh of relief because I really do think they are have some accountability and responsibility to a new generation of investors. And it's quite an opportunity for them. You know, if they can, if they can think in terms of a decade instead of quarter to quarter, man, they're in the catbird seat, you know? And uh, there's an incredible opportunity. So maybe now, you know, they've gone public, they've gotten through the phase of having to kind of you know, make whole their original investors and, and uh, hopefully they can do something positive uh, from here on out. We've lived through uh, an unusual few years because we've had COVID, people locked at home, people trading yeah. probably more than they would otherwise have done. And then we've had some unusual ramps in GameStop, AMC, and then also in crypto and now in NFTs. Uh, to what extent are they sort of reliant on this boom bubble ramping type behavior? And in a more normal market yeah. where there's less of that speculative behavior going on, how do they fare? Robin Hood? Yeah. I think they're less in big trading. trouble. Yeah. I think they're in big trouble, you know? And so um, I have been uh, developing some ideas at a website called shapeofrisk.com. And what I've been doing is looking at price data in histograms, okay? So uh, your audience probably knows what a histogram is, right? But you know, there's the bell curve, right? The normal distribution. So if you look at you know, how prices change from day to day, how many times are they you know, up less than 1% or down less than 1% or one to 2% or minus 1% to 2%, right? You know, for mature assets, you have a normal distribution. Most of the changes are plus or minus 1% on a given day, right? Um, but when you look at things like GameStop and AMC and Dogecoin and even Bitcoin, although it's, you know, it's maturing a bit, um, what you see is almost nothing in the middle and huge tail poles of my, my tails are plus or minus 5%, okay? So an asset that moves, you know, 5% or more up in a day or 5% or more down in a day, okay? So when you look at AMC Entertainment, for example, you know, over the past year, it's nothing but two big poles at the end every day. It's up plus or minus 5% or down 5% or more, right? This is going back to what triggers that maximum dopamine release, right? That is the equivalent of randomness. That's the equivalent of a coin flip. It's an environment that your brain can't make sense of. And so when you do get a reward, it's like, oh, what a relief, you know? Finally, something makes sense. 
it's only temporary because it's actually just a, a, an, a, a random event that you're interpreting as you being intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> but really it's randomness, you know, that you can't make sense of that all of a sudden you think you're right. And that's a powerful experience and you want to keep doing it again. Right. So that is, you know, you look at all these stocks and cryptos that are generating such buzz and they all have that pattern. They all have that pattern. I call it polarization. Okay. Okay. And I think in general, social media and user as product business models all have this tendency to profit from polarization. And the polarization, what it does is it creates engagement, it creates stickiness, you know, it creates actually um, cognitive dissonance. And because, you know, we are sense making uh, creatures, right? We want to make sense of things. We just lean in, you know, to try to make sense of something that actually isn't, is maybe cautious here, but Random you know, there's an element of it that's intentionally nonsensical. Okay. What was it intentionally nonsensical? Yeah. So, um, because it's highly profitable. <laughs> so in the world of finance, okay, you know, I mean, you can say that Robinhood didn't create GameStop, but Robinhood certainly figured out a way to profit from GameStop and they certainly figured out a way to um, make it easy to participate in that GameStop frenzy, right? Are they drawing it to people's attention on the app as well? Are they showing that there's lots of moves in the stock? And so this might be one of those opportunities where you can get that big dopamine hit if you go in this and trade I'd it. I'd love to see, you know, what are their algorithms that decide what gets in front of their users? What opportunities get in front of their users? Where, how are they subtly directing the attention of their users, right? Um, so, you know... I mean, in the GameStop thing, it was Robin Hood, it was Wall Street bets. So Reddit got a huge boost. I mean, look at how much Reddit and Robin Hood benefited from the GameStop phenomenon, not just in terms of revenues, but in terms of, you know, cementing themselves in the public consciousness, right? Um, and, uh, you know, Citadel Securities, I... I Paul Rowdy again was just talking about how God bless him, you know, Citadel Securities basically bailed out Melvin Capital, right? Um, well, you know, there's there's a pretty compelling narrative of why that was actually really good thing to do for their risk book, given you know the position they had gotten into with GameStop of one, you know, having to sell put options. You know, or take the other side of the call options, right? So essentially be short the stock and then have the gamma squeeze come into play, right? Where you have to buy, you know, call options or buy the stock to hedge your, your risk, right? And then, um, you know, how do you make sure that you're not going to be caught upside down if this thing unravels, right? So all of that is going on behind the scenes. And, um, you know, I think it is something that the industry really needs to look at in terms of incentives that it creates for novice investors and the risk that puts novice investors at of, you know, ultimately having a, a disappointing experience and being alienated from the markets for the next couple of decades. You know, you think they're mad at Wall Street now. <laughs> Have that, you know, really blow up in everybody's face. And then it'll be game over. You know? It's sort of inevitable, so, isn't it? It feels inevitable. I am a hopeless optimist. So, um, you know, I have seen our seen society do miraculous things before. Don't ask me to name one right now, but <laughs> <laughs> put a man on the moon. Uh, what's your but, background, Richard? Uh, so, how do you how do you come to be interested in in risk and this analysis of the markets? Where you know you use a histogram type approach yeah, to look at the moves. Yeah, well, um, so my undergrad was in mathematics, and then uh, I ended up doing a PhD in a field called systems science, 
And, um, but my focus was on um, decision making under uncertainty and using probability and information theory to um, help people be more help at that point, researchers and scientists actually be more honest about the uncertainties in their models and not, you know, put um, premature assumptions in there that then propagated, you know, throughout the system and led to some, you know, poor policy choices. So, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by human psychology. I love math and computers and human behavior, right? So, um, so, you know, it was natural and it was also, you know, I finished my PhD in 2000. <laughs> so uh, I was in the markets like everybody else was, right? And, um, you know, I decided not to continue on with an academic career. I wanted to actually develop education and technology to help people make better decisions under uncertainty. The markets were a natural place to do that. So um, I developed a website called tradestops.com in 2005 that started to bring trailing stop loss alerts to retail investors like me at the time. And um, it actually you know, was something that the brokers didn't offer at the time. And if they did offer it, then you, know, you could only keep your alerts in the market for 60 days or so. And you didn't even know if you were kind of giving visibility to the market or not. So that business grew. And, uh, you know, and eventually I really connected it to behavioral finance and to the work of Kahneman and Tversky and Richard Thaler and loss aversion, right? Nobel prizes in economics because we hate to lose, but that loss aversion, the fact that we hate to lose manifests itself differently when we're losing on a position versus when we're winning on a position. So when we are losing, um, we don't want to sell. In the words of Daniel Kahneman, we are risk seeking when we're losing. We take more risk, right? So we amplify our risk actually when we're losing. Um, and, but conversely, when we're winning, our fear of loss attaches itself to our profits and we become fearful of losing our profits. So we actually become risk averse when we're winning. So we're risk averse risk seeking when we're losing, we're risk averse when we're winning. Uh, the only thing that academics and technicians agree on is that markets manifest momentum, right? <laughs> so <laughs> things that are going down tend to keep going down. Things that are going up tend to keep going up. And uh, so, you know, you have this recipe for um, chasing losses, right? Being risk seeking when you're losing. So you finally throw in the towel because you can't take the pain anymore. You end up with a 90% loss. Well, to make up a 90% loss, you have to have a thousand percent gain. Okay. It's not just a 90% gain. It's a thousand percent gain. You need 10 X, right? But you know, you get a 50%, hundred percent profit. You're like, Hey, take that off the table, right? I don't want to lose that. So, so, you know, so much of, investing is behavioral and psychological, right? And that's really like why this stuff about addiction has really snapped into place for me and explained so many things is that, you know, I mean, hey, you mentioned the quote earlier from Keynes about, you know, if you have the gambling instinct, you gotta pay the toll. And, um, you know, unfortunately it seems to me like so much of retail finance today is actually just monetizing the gambling instinct. And so meanwhile, if you can, you know, admit that and accept that, then your mandate is actually to put yourself in a different um, situation than everybody else, you know, because the markets transfer wealth from the inpatient to the patient. And uh, so, you know, it's an incredible opportunity to actually start to really study your own behavior Make sure you're not behaving in the way that the mass majority of participants are behaving. And that's where you can really find your edge, okay? So I interviewed Jack Schwager, the author of all the Market Wizards books over at the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. And um, 
And, you know, you ask Jack, what's, what do all the market wizards have in common? And he says, well, pretty much nothing. I mean, they're each as different, you know, as, uh, um, as you could imagine. But the one thing they do all have in common is they all have a pretty rigorous commitment to risk management. <laughs> okay. Where is risk management in retail finance? You know, let me ask you, right? I mean, maybe you got a trailing stop here or there on a single stock, you know, but where do you find in retail finance things like correlation or, um, you know, sharp or sortino, right? Or one I love is value at risk, you know, and you know all these things. Professionals know all these things. They are completely absent in the retail world. So my personal quest is to actually, you know, make risk management, risk budgeting, risk spending something that retail finance really finally understands and can um, uh, start to leverage, right? And I don't think it can be done in a kind of a technical academic way. I think it has to be done in a fun and, you know, and a new way, a kind of you know, edgy way and a great user experience. So that's what I'm really working on. You know, I saw on your website, for example, you have kind of your one, two, three step uh, for your acquirers um, model, right? And, uh, you know, in step two, you talk about volatility. You know, you talk about big, big stocks, you know, less volatile, small stocks, more volatile, more stocks together at once, less volatile. That's, one of the things I'm really working on. So Ray Dalio called the holy grail of investing 15 to 20 good uncorrelated return streams. So how do you help people build their own custom portfolios of good uncorrelated return streams? How do you help people, you know, understand that, you know, you can uh, have some influence over volatility by structuring your portfolio in a certain way and you can budget your risk and then you can go spend that risk in a way to maximize reward. How do you achieve that? That's a totally that? different way of thinking about, you know, what investing is, right? Than uh, YOLO and, you know, take down the man. How, how do you achieve that in a practical sense? The risk budgeting, risk spending? Well, <clears throat> so take value at risk as a simple model. So a 95% value at risk model, right? So if you have a portfolio that says 95% of the time, you know, uh, you should do better than this, okay? So if you ask yourself, hey, here's my portfolio, what's my 95% value at risk, okay? So got, you know, $100,000 in the market. Oh, if I just use this model on my current portfolio, it says that once every 20 days or about once a month, my portfolio is going to be down, likely to be down, say, you know, $3,000 in a day. That's a good number to know, right? So to go in, look, say, you know, hey, once a month, I should expect to open up my app and see my 100 grand portfolio down by 3%. All right, I can live with that. You know, I know it's coming. I, I, my expectations are now better aligned with market history and market reality, right? So, um, and you might look at that number and go, 3% in a day is too much for me. You know, like I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. I need to figure out how to restructure my portfolio to make that, you know, $1,500 as my worst day in a month, right? So you can do that. You know, those tools exist. They're you know, they're table stakes for professional investors. So meanwhile, I'm working on a new app, some financial technology. You can start to see it at shapeofrisk.com. And, uh, you know, I don't need to call it value at risk for the retail public. I actually call it D score, which D stands for damn. So this is the number that once a month, if you look at your phone, you know, and you see your portfolio down that much in a day, you go, oh, damn. That hurt, you know, but hey, I signed up for this, right? Um, and then, you know, to, to gradually interact with, um, with risk management on a daily basis and start to 
to understand your own risk tolerance, I think is a huge opportunity um, to use mobile technology to start to create a feedback mechanism and to start to present the public with risk management data um, and to have people interacting with risk and reward and thinking in terms of risk and reward, right? I think price is a hallucinogenic drug, you know? And this really like clicked for me when I was talking to my mom, if you're listening, mom, sorry. Uh, and she said, your sister bought some Dogecoin because it was cheap. This is when Dogecoin was 75 cents, you know? And I was like, I pulled my hair out. That's when all my hair went away. <laughs> it was like, mom, Dogecoin is not cheap. You add up all the Dogecoin in the world, it's worth like $75 billion right now. It's worth more than half the companies in the S&P 500 and they don't do anything. There's not even, even any development it's a going gag. on. You know, so look, I love the community. I love the spirit, you know, I love the camaraderie, but that doesn't add up to $75 billion of value. And just because a Dogecoin costs less than a dollar doesn't make it cheap, right? So that kind of thinking is really, um, you know, I, I think hallucinatory is an accurate description, right? So how can we kind of get people away from price start to look at things like risk and reward um, and uh, do some risk budgeting and then use correlation to um, spend their risk more effectively and ultimately create a shape of risk that works for them. One of the problems with value at risk and um, you know option pricing is that we make that simplifying assumption that it is a normal distribution. And yeah. as anybody who's spent any time in the markets or read anything knows, um, yeah. the thousand year storm rolls around about every seven years. Yeah. And the, the, the technical term for that is the tails or leptokurtotic, they're fat tails. There's more probability distribution in the tails than we understand. Yeah. And yeah. the difficulty might be for people who've been in the market for one or two or three years is that that feels like a long period of time in the market. <laughs> Yeah. But it's difficult to conceive of these gigantic moves, these gigantic waves that come through until you've seen them. Yeah. And uh, that really is that very remote, unlikely thing. It only happens yeah. a handful of times in a decade. Yep. But yep. it is the, the, the thing that really destroys portfolios, particularly because it's, people see that wave for the first time and then they never want to get back in the water. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, whether or not you can uh, manage that wave has to do with the level of risk that you're taking in the markets, right? You have to model for that. You have to say, you know, am I okay with this falling 50%, 60%? If you're not, you know, you really shouldn't be in the markets. So that brings me back to my proposal for, uh, for Gary Gensler, right? So instead of banning payment for order flow, let's take on the more volatile, you know, widespread instruments. Let's take a portion of that spread, okay? Let's take a portion of that price improvement and put it into an educational fund. I see, you know, online investing today as being a lot like smoking 30 years ago, right? We know it's got pitfalls. We know it's got problems. We don't want to, you know, crimp people's freedom and, you know, regulate away freedom, regulate away markets. But we do have an obligation to really educate people about exactly that kind of thing, right? So, you know, don't ban payment for order flow. Let's, I, I like to use inverse, inverse volatility, right? I mean, if there's price improvement on, you know, S&P 500 stocks, you know, you don't need a kickback for that. But when, <laughs> but uh, if it's, you know, penny stocks, options, you know, more volatile stuff that tends to be the stuff that triggers addictive interactions with the markets, you know, let's take a portion of that, put it into an educational fund and really have a campaign to educate, you know, a new generation of people about, you um, 
what they can do if they're in these markets for 30, 40, 50 years, you know, in an effective, intelligent way. And if they start now, what could that do for them, right? So I think there's such an opportunity there. I don't want to just preach to the younger generation and say, you know, hey, you dummies, because that's not what this is about. I think they're incredibly smart. Um, and, uh, you know, but they are young and we were all young once and we know what that feels like, you know? So, you know, let's work together to really educate a new generation of investors. Um, yeah, to have some fun, but also to really, uh, you know, make the power of the markets work for them. Uh, on that note, Richard, we're coming up on time. So if folks want to get in contact with you or follow along with what you're doing, what's the best way to go about doing that? Thanks for asking. Uh, DrRichardSmith.com is one place that uh, I publish a, a bi-weekly newsletter right now called The Risk Rituals for free. Put some video content up there writing about these ideas, writing about dopamine and addiction and um, uh, user as product. Uh, and then um, the easiest place to follow my budding uh, technology efforts right now is shapeofrisk.com. And you can see a variety of histograms there, what they look like. And you can even start to combine a few histograms to build your own portfolio you know, and decide how you want your risk to look like, right? So very excited about that. Um, people have been checking it out and giving me great feedback and uh, ultimately working on building a place that, you know, do-it-yourself asset managers. And I think in some ways we're all being, we're all asset managers today. And I think the whole concept of what an asset is, is really expanding dramatically from the availability of data decentralized finance, et cetera, right? Um, tokenization, I think all those things are really expanding um, what we consider an investable asset. And uh, so I'm building tools to help people really uh, embrace asset management in an intuitive way, um, not just in equities and cryptos, but even beyond. Well, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Richard Smith. Thank you, Tobias. It's been great speaking with you.